every language and every people group end up having phrases and figures of speech um, that come from different sources that just get woven into the language over the process of time. Sometimes those figures of speech come from literature and some concise quotation or statement that some a poet or author might have made. Sometimes they might come from uh, formal speeches that were given by diplomats or statespeople as they've had different occasions and a certain phrase such as from Winston Churchill or from somebody else just sticks in everyone's mind after that. Sometimes the phrases come from trades in terms of a blacksmith or a carpenter or a tradesperson might have just could have been a phrase that was characteristic of that particular walk of life that just gets carried over and brought into the mainstream of the language. Sometimes they're just from everyday life that after frequent usage they just get picked up. This morning I'm going to be referring to a phrase that is hang in there. Now hang in there is a phrase that I thought okay I know what that means. If you do a search for it, don't do it now on your smartphones, but if you do a search for it, you'll find that it, it basically means just to keep on going when things get difficult and whatnot. It's kind of curious where the phrase came from in terms of its origin. And I imagine, well, I suppose it could have been maybe a sailor, could have had maybe something about, I don't know, I wasn't sure what it was. I, I thought maybe it was some other tradesperson and that's where it came from. But I was very surprised to find out that that phrase has only been with us since about 1971. And there's a specific start point where all of a sudden you can see that carried through our, our society. And the background to that is that there was a poster that was printed back in 1971 of a little kitten that was holding on with two paws onto like a bamboo stick that was going across. And underneath that it said, hang in there, baby. And the photographer that actually did this, um, his name was Victor Baldwin, and he had, he and his wife loved cats. He was a very successful photographer in Hollywood, and he had taken photographs of famous people, but his real love was for animals, and he and his wife loved cats, and he actually had taken that particular picture that was used in that poster in 1963, and then he and his wife had published two books about cats. And that picture was the back cover photo for the second book about cats. The second book about cats um, was called The Outcast Kitten. And it was all about some kitten that was adopted by a mother cat, whatever it was, and it was always the, the, sort of like the ugly duckling, it was like the leftover one. And so that was the picture of their cat, uh, and the cat's name, here I have somewhere, is, was Sassy. And it was on the back page of that particular book called The Outcast Kitten. Well, people bought the book. When the book was published, they loved the picture on the back cover and they wanted it. And it was in answer to that that he then published the poster. And he wrote the words at the bottom, hang in there, baby. And it actually, in history, is one of the first motivational posters. He didn't he intend it that way, but it was because people wanted the picture and he published the poster that, was, that got stuck on there. Copyright 1971, Victor Baldwin. If you bring up any of the pictures, it all goes back to him. But the picture and the idea has been used for the last umpteen years, ever since 1971. Hang in there is a phrase that's just common. You may not have known, I didn't know that, but that was the background that it went back to. It, if you go back even further, the very first recorded photograph in 1836 was a French photographer who took a picture of his cat, which he called croissant, hanging from a silver thread. And that was the first recorded photograph in 1836. And it suggested that Victor Baldwin might have been inspired by that first picture when he had this. Um, Anyway, it's just interesting history as you go back and, and, and learn about that, some of the background. But the whole idea of hang in there is the title of my message today. And that's the background for the picture and where you heard the phrase. But the message title is hang in there. And as we look at that, our text today is Paul's message to Timothy. And it's in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 12 through the first part of verse 15. And in these verses, Paul is basically saying to Timothy, Timothy, hang in there. Paul never saw that motivational poster. He didn't use those words. Otherwise, I probably could find a Greek on it, but no, never mind. 
But uh, Paul's words are hang in there. He's telling Timothy, Timothy, hang in there. Now, even though Paul was telling this to Timothy, and Paul was certainly writing to Timothy as a pastor, we can find instructions to hang in there all over the scriptures in different places. In Ephesians chapter 6, you don't have to turn there right now, I'll mention it again later, but Ephesians chapter 6 is the familiar passage that talks about how we are supposed to put on the whole armor of God. And so that the idea is that after the day and after the battle, we're still going to be standing. That's the same principle of hang in there so that you're still standing when the battle's all over. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 4 through 7, we looked at that uh, during the course of the last year as we went through 1 Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter is talking about how you're going to go through trials now, and even though you're going through trials, it will be worth it all. And at the end, you'll find out how it will be worth it all. Very similar principle to what Paul is emphasizing here. In 1 Corinthians 9, verses 25 to 27, Paul speaks about how people compete, and as they compete, they try to win. And he says they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. And so this whole idea for us as believers to hang in there and to not give up, we can find throughout the scripture. This morning we're looking specifically at these verses, and the challenge that I'm bringing today is don't give up. Keep your eyes on Jesus and anticipate his return. Don't give up. Keep your eyes on Jesus and anticipate his return. I'll begin reading then in 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning with verse 12, down to the beginning of chapter 5, or verse 15, rather. Verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you, in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time. I'm going to stop there at just the first part of verse 15. As we look at these verses, Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, he just given Timothy all sorts of warnings before this. Back in verse 3, he was saying, watch out for people that have the wrong teaching. Then he gave warning. He said, watch out for people that just care about getting more financially or more materialistically. He says, watch out for those people. And then in verse 11, which we looked at last week, he gave a series of six different specific things for Timothy to be pursuing. He said, Timothy, make sure you're seeking after righteousness and godliness and so on. I'm not going to read the verse again. But Paul has given now warning, warning, we'll go after these things. And now he's saying, Timothy, don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. It's going to be worth it all. It's going to be well worth it, Timothy, when you look for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's saying, in other words, hang in there, Timothy, because the Lord's going to be guiding and directing you. Now, as we look at this and realize that this is something that is a challenge for every one of us as God's children, to hang in there. There are different times in our lives where we need to be reminded of this. You know, when things are going well, you don't need extra help when things are going well. You look at the guardrails on the side of the road, you don't really need the guardrails as long as you're staying where you're supposed to in your lane. You don't need the guardrails unless you somehow lose control or hit a patch of ice or something happens and you need the guardrails to keep you from going off the edge of the cliff or the, into the river or whatever might be down below. And we don't always necessarily feel like we need the encouragement that comes in Scripture, but you never know when. And the person sitting next to you or be front, in front of you or behind you could be going in a very, through a very different time in his or her life than you might be at the time, or you than he or she, as the case may be. I would suggest there are certain times that we need this reminder. There are four different times that I've come up with, but this is not an exhaustive list. You need this encouragement when it's hard as a believer. And there'll be times when wherever you are, it will be hard. If it's not, then there's something wrong. <laughs> but there will be times when it will be hard. A second time is when you're discouraged. And that may not be the same as the hard. It could just be because of things that have happened. There's discouragement that can settle in. And we need to be reminded it's going to be worth it all. We need to hang in there. A third time is when questions arise. And sometimes questions can arise in any of our hearts. They're, they sort of might just sort of be a, a little bit 
hard to see and hard to, hard to articulate, but they're just like a feeling or an emotion or something. It's almost like a, the wind blowing the, uh, the surface of the snow. And you know how the snow kind of whiffs and wafts around, you know, on a, a powdery, snowy day? And sometimes we have a feeling that's almost as mysterious and we just can't put our finger on it. Sometimes those questions is, is it worth it all? Is it worth it to keep going? Sometimes the question is, does it really matter? Sometimes the question might be, can God still use me just because of this, that, or whatever? And those questions go through our minds and they almost at first are hard to articulate or see like the wafting snow across the surface of the field. And yet, we need to come back to the encouragement the passage brings. And the last I would give is when there are challenges ahead, that you could be facing big challenges. I mean, you've been fine heretofore and up to the present, but there are challenges out there. Maybe the unknown, maybe decisions, maybe a, a chapter of your life that's going to be different. But when you're facing challenges ahead, we need the times of encouragement this passage brings. So I would suggest four different categories for that show relevance to the passage we're looking at today. In verse 12, Paul begins with his first instruction, fight the good fight of faith. Now this is a little bit hard to figure out what Paul's talking about because it's a metaphor. He's using the fight of faith. He's using a word picture here. It's interesting that I've looked at many commentaries on this particular verse and and no one really has a lot to say about what exactly Paul means. The most helpful of all that I found is a comment that this fight of faith is referring to um, the characteristic quality of the Christian life which must be maintained to the very end. This walk of faith is what the Christian life is all about. And I can see some substance to that and some significance to it. In Romans chapter 1, Paul spoke about the gospel and he focused in upon the fact that it's a matter of faith. Your life, my life, the life of a believer should be a life of faith. You exercise faith in God for what his word has said, for the promises that are in scripture. Your life must be a life of faith. And so when Paul says here, fight the good fight of faith, Paul could be speaking in the general term, the general sense, not something specific to Paul as a preacher, past, as Timothy being a pastor, but just, you have made a profession. He's going to talk about that in a minute. Fight the good fight of faith. But the second point is the choice of words here. Fighting the good fight of faith, there are a couple of words and cognates that are used here that are dealing with the type of an, an agonizing struggle, something that has to be pursued. This is not a walk in the park. It's not in the rose garden. It's a struggle and it's a challenge. The same word is used in the context of battle in terms of fighting, and that's the word that's been translated here. But it's also borrowed from the athletic realm. And it's a matter of a con contest, whether it's a race or a struggle or a wrestling match or whatever it is, it's a matter of an ongoing struggle. The specific word picture that Paul was trying to picture here, I believe, is along the lines of the fight but it helps put in perspective that the Christian life is a warfare, it's a race, it's a struggle. And it's necessary for us to be reminded of that. And Paul is saying, keep on going with the struggle. Keep on pursuing it, Timothy. He's going to explain that it's going to be worth it all, but he's saying, Timothy, yes, it's a struggle. But when you're tempted to throw in the towel, when you're discouraged, when you're facing hard times, when you're asking yourself questions, maybe rhetorical, but when you're just questioning things, when you're facing a huge challenge ahead, Timothy, keep on going with pursuit of that particular of the faith. The second point that we can see in verse 12 is Paul says, um, keep focused on eternal life. And in the second part of verse 12, he says, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and I'm just going to look at that part of it right now, but he says, take hold of the eternal life. In Matthew, Christ spoke about how there are all the things that the Gentiles seek after, all the things of the world. James speaks about how people can have lusts and desires for all these things. We have all these things that we can pursue, but there's a sense that Christ was saying, don't lay up for yourself treasures here on earth. 
but instead lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Paul said, you are citizens of heaven. This is where your focus needs to be. And Paul is saying to Timothy in this passage, Timothy, take hold of eternal life to which you are called. And I'd urge you to be thoughtful of that, like every day, like remind yourself, you know, this world is not, like the song says, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. Or as you look at the stuff that's taking all your attention and energy and time today or tomorrow, that this is not the end. And Paul is saying to Timothy, keep in perspective the eternal life that God has. Verse 12, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. And then the second part of that, um, and to which you have made confession in the presence of many witnesses. Now, Paul seems to be alluding here to some time that Timothy made a statement or gave a message or presented something, obviously in the presence of a number of different people. And different commentaries have their opinions of what this could be. No one's really speaking authoritatively because we don't know. It would have been very possible that Paul's alluding to Timothy's first profession of salvation when he gave a testimony of his faith and trust in Christ. That would have been a possibility that Paul's alluding to. Or it could have been at his baptismal testimony, a time when Timothy would have given recognition of the Lord, maybe at the time that he was baptized. That would, was not uncommon back in the first century. Or it could also have been a time when Timothy was commissioned for service, when he would have gone into uh, formally being acknowledged as being a, a pastor or bishop or missionary or assistant of Paul, whatever it was. It could have been any of those three times, or it could have been something else. The fact is, we don't know. But the interesting point that Paul's making is, is not, does not rest on whether we can figure out which of those it is. The point that Paul's making is that there are many people that witnessed and heard your testimony, Timothy, of what you're professing. And I would remind you today that there are many people that have heard your testimony, or your word of faith, or your they, or they saw your bumper sticker, or they, they heard that verse that you, that you shared one time, or that whatever it is, you're, you've had a testimony before people that have seen and heard you. And Paul's reminding Timothy in a similar way, Timothy, remember all the people that have seen and heard your particular testimony? He's trying to give perspective. Timothy, it's going to be worth it all. You've already given a confession amongst many people. And then he goes on to the third one, the third point. And the, third, the first point, by the way, was keep living your faith. That's the first half of verse 12. The second one is keep focused on eternal life. That was the second half of verse 12. And now the third one is keep walking purely. And that's verses 14 and 15. In verses 14 and 15, Paul uh, calls, excuse me, verses 13 and 14, Verses 13 and 14, uh, Paul is telling Timothy that, and charging him in verse 13, that in verse 14 he keeps the commandment without stain or reproach. That's the first part of verse 15. So it, Paul is basically getting warmed up in verse 13. Verse 14 he says, now keep the commandment without stain or reproach. I'll read the verses together. Verse 13, I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's challenge as he's speaking to him is he starts off by referencing God. And it's important for you and I to remember that God is over all. When you're in those times that you're questioning and not sure what's happening, those times that you are asking questions or it's hard, remember God is over all. As we shared earlier with the verses that uh, Betsy was commenting on, Jesus has promised to never leave us or forsake us. God is with us. God is with you. God knows what you're facing. And Paul begins this challenge even by saying, I charge you in the presence of God. And there's a sense with which God is the one that's overseeing what's happening in your life. He's watching out for you. He knows what you're facing, and he knows the struggles of what you're dealing with in your heart, and your emotions, even as you've got whatever it is on the table before you. And Paul's saying, I charge you in the presence of God 
who gives life to all. It's interesting that Paul acknowledges what we also can see in the Psalms, where it says that God is good, God is good, God is good. God gives life, God gives food to all creatures. He is sovereign, he is over all. Every good and perfect gift comes down from him. Paul ties this back to the fact that God is over all. He's the one that gives life to all. And I'm charging you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. And then the shift is different. It now shifts to Jesus Christ, his son. And Paul uses Christ as an example. We are told in Hebrews that we are to keep our eyes fixed on him. We are told that we're supposed to be looking to him. Paul talked about how he lays aside everything else and he just wants to have his focus completely on Christ. But Paul is saying here, keep your eyes focused on the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Timothy, Timothy, when Christ was standing before Pontius Pilate and he was on trial, he gave good testimony. He was our example. We can see this in the other passages that speak about uh, Christ as our example. I'd like you to turn with me, please, to 1 Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 25, Peter talks about keeping your eyes on Christ. Paul's words for Timothy in facing hard time was keep your eyes on Christ. Peter's words for all of us as believers is keep your eyes on Christ. Look what he endured. Look what he did. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats but kept him tr trusting himself to him who judges rightly, righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his own body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you are healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, and now you return to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Peter is saying, keep your eyes on Christ, Think of him as he was going through his trial, as he was going through the examination in a sense by the Roman soldiers, as he was being persecuted, as he was being nailed to the cross and all those, keep your eyes on him. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says, Therefore, seeing we, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so in easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. It's interesting, here's that picture of a race or a contest again. The writer of Hebrews is saying that, look, us, put aside all those things, those things that can so easily, keep in mind that you have people that are watching you. There's a whole cloud of witnesses. Verse two, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I share those other verses with you because Peter challenged us, the writer of Hebrews challenged us, and Paul is challenging Timothy. Timothy, look to the example of Christ Jesus. He testified a good confession. You have a lot of witnesses that were there when you gave your witness and testimony. And the challenge now, verse 14, is to keep the commandment without stain or reproach. There's a, a blamelessness that is, that is presented here. It's God's standard and our desire. God's standard and our desire is purity. I say it's God's standard. It's our desire because we fail. Every one of us fall. Every one of us will fail one place or another or over and over again. Every one of us will at times. But this is God's standard and we keep coming back. And the times that we might be inclined to think, God, is it worth it? And does God have any use for me? When we ask those questions, we must come back to the fact that God forgives. We looked at a whole message on 1 Samuel chapter 7 about that earlier today. The message of hope. When God's people repent and turn from their sin, 
God returns, responds, and heals. And Paul is saying here, Timothy, your life is supposed to be one that is lived, that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach. And then the last part, this will be finishing up, the last part is Christ is coming back. Keep that in mind, Timothy. He didn't come back during Timothy's life. He may come back during any of our lives. We don't know. But the point is, Christ is coming back. And the sense here is that it's going to be worth it all. It'll be worth it all when we see Christ. It'll be worth it all when we stand in his presence. And so Paul is saying, keep this commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will bring about at the proper time. We don't know what the time is going to be. We don't, some, people, some people will say at almost any period of history, surely it must be soon because of the mess we are in. And that's characteristic today, and it's been characteristic of the last 2,000 years, depending upon who the dictator was, or what the form of oppression was, or what the government was, or what was happening. And so, the point is that we don't know the time, but he will bring it about at the proper time. God knows when that will be. And the point that he's saying to Timothy, Timothy, you make sure you keep applying yourself to God's standards, seeking this, to fulfill it in your life by his grace. So the challenge I would give to you this morning is hang in there. Specifically, don't give up. Keep your eyes on Jesus and anticipate his return. The parts of the message are keep living your faith, keep focused on eternal life, and keep walking purely as we look at the three commands Paul gives in these passages. And it will be worth it all, so hang in there. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, I pray that as we would reflect on Paul's encouragement to Timothy to keep on going, to hang in there, to hold on, to the testimony he'd had, to all that had been invested in him and what he was responsible for. Help us to remember to keep fighting the good fight. We must go forward by faith, every single one of us. When, we're, when it's hard, when we're discouraged, when we have questions arising in our mind, is it worth it, does it matter, can God still use me? And when we face challenges ahead, Help us to be reminded by these challenges that it will be worth it all. So we must hang in there. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.